What does Victoria's Secret have to do with credit cards? Who are the transactors in Revolvers? What is sticky debt? All of this and more on today's episode of The Secret Life of Numbers. Welcome to the Secret Life of Numbers podcast, the podcast where we dissect everyday numbers and statistics to find the stories behind them. Each episode, we take a different number or statistic and break it down. We will tell you where it comes from and what it means for you. Along the way, hopefully we will inspire you to think about the numbers in your own life. I'm LaVanya, your data scientist on call, and I'll be breaking down the numbers. I'm Lindsay, your data translator. For when LaVanya gets too technical on us, I'll be breaking down the rest. (laughs) All right, let's jump in. So, Lindsay, this is actually the second episode of our three-part mini-series. Are you excited? Very excited. I can't wait. Yes. So for those of you who have listened to the first episode in our mini-series, it was about compound interest. Today, we're going to be talking about credit cards and how you calculate the interest on credit cards. If you haven't listened to that episode on compound interest, we recommend you go back and have a listen, because that'll help you understand what we talk about here today. And then our final episode will be next week, where we talk about the debt to income ratio. Exciting stuff, all very useful topics. Yeah. Part of the inspiration behind doing an episode on credit cards is actually a bit of a rumor that we heard. Now, we don't often make a habit of gossiping, (laughs) (laughs) but we felt we had to share. Yes. Well, I mean, also... I love gossip. I know. (laughs) I probably shouldn't. (laughs) It's like a train wreck. You can't look away. So the rumor is, while I was listening to a podcast researching this episode, I heard that Victoria's Secret actually makes more money from their credit cards than they do from selling lingerie. Okay, so that's not so shady to me because isn't the whole point of Victoria's Secret to sell the merchandise? Well, you would think... But they're a public business, so they're on the stock market. So I think the whole point is to make money in whatever way possible. I guess so. For the record, let it be known that I couldn't confirm this, but it was curious. Yeah, it was interesting, Mm. too, how it's very hard to find that information. But it does make you wonder, how do credit cards really work? Exactly. So how do credit cards work? Why do Mm -hmm. we even have credit cards? Where do they come from? And how are Canadians using their credit cards? So I guess I can start because there's a lot to unpack there, but let's start with how credit cards work. All right, let's jump in. Okay, so do you have a credit card, Lindsay? I do. I do have a credit card. Just one, though. Okay, me too. All right, so credit cards allow for something called revolving credit. So every month you can make purchases like, you know, you'll swipe, you'll tap to your heart's content. And every month... As long as you don't exceed your credit limit, you'll get a bill. And your billing cycle is usually 27 to 30 days, depending on your credit card company. And all of this is seen on your statement. And that statement will come on the same day of every month. And typically, you have a grace period of 21 days from the end of the billing cycle to pay the amount that's on your statement. Right. Or if you pay the balance on your statement in total by the end of that grace period, you're never going to have to pay interest. Which is what you want. (laughs) Which is what you want to do. But if you don't pay it in its entirety, that's when things get interesting. I have a question. Go for it. So we learned last week all about compound interest, how you calculate it. Mm -hmm. And we hinted at the fact that some credit cards compound daily the interest compounds daily yes so when i was researching this episode i found that there are actually two ways in which credit cards operate depending on the credit card so you can either have a credit card that compounds daily or a credit card that compounds monthly and i would like to read you a paragraph that i found 
on my own credit card statement. I went digging into it just for you. And let's see if you know what it means. I make absolutely no no guarantees okay. here. <laughs> I will say that I had to like increase the font on my statement because it was like in gray and like really go digging. But here we go. So to calculate your interest in the calculating your balance section of your statement, where there is only one applicable interest rate in a statement period, we add the amount you owe each day and divide by the total number of days in the statement period. So far, so good? I think so. I feel like there's lots of extra like clauses that are added in. This is probably written by a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple qualifiers, but we'll keep going. This is your average daily balance. Where you have an installment plan, we use the total principal amount of your installment plan, still outstanding, including installments not yet due as the amount that you owe each day to calculate your average daily balance. Where you have more than one applicable interest rate in a statement period, we determine your average daily balance for each rate. We then multiply the average daily balance for each rate by the applicable daily interest rate, obtained by taking the annual interest rate and dividing by the number of days in the year. We then multiply this value by the total number of days in the statement period to determine the interest we charge you. I'm going to be honest, my eyes glazed over <laughs> and my brain was like, I think we should go to our happy place. <laughs> okay, well, let's break it down. First, they talk about your interest rate in a statement period. So these seem to be some important things that we need to keep an eye on. And then they go in to talk about calculating an average daily balance in the second bit. Right. We add the amount you owe each day and divide the total by the number of days in the statement period. This is your average daily balance. And then the very last sentence, they say that they multiply this value, the average daily balance, by the total number of days in the statement period to determine the interest. So it's kind of looking like we've got a few things that we need to know to calculate your interest total. You need your rate. You need to know your average daily balance, and you need to know the number of days in the statement period. Right. So I figured we could explain this with an example. I think we should do an example because <laughs> I, I know that the math isn't hard per se because it's, it's multiplication and division and some percentages, but it just sounds really challenging. It does, right? I read it to you. Like you said, there were a lot of qualifiers. It wasn't immediately obvious how we would, would calculate your interest on your credit card. Yeah, it's like trying to get a formula out of legalese. <laughs> okay, so I have an example. Excellent. All right, so let's pretend you have a credit card. And all credit cards have what's called an, an APR or an annual percentage rate. Um, so this... APR is typically around 20%. So for the purposes of our example, we're just going to say it's 20%. And because I'm hoping for the summertime, we're going to say we're in July. And your billing <laughs> period is going to be July 7th to July 27th. Okay. Okay. And in this time, we spend $500 on your credit card. Okay. Okay. Conservative amount. We're doing well. Yes. We're, we didn't like splurge too much, you know. I don't know about you, but I've been a little bit more conservative in my spending now that I'm stuck at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I realize I don't need like more cute clothes to go out because I just stay <laughs> in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the July seventh to July twenty seventh, you spend five hundred dollars. You have a grace period of a month in this case. So on August twenty seventh, your grace period is up, and it's time to pay this money. But let's say when August twenty seventh comes you only pay the minimum balance for that statement. And in this case, we're going to say the minimum balance is $10. Which sounds so manageable, right? You feel good. Yes. But then that means on August 28th, you owe $490. Uh-oh. So from August 28th to September 15th, we're going to carry this balance. And then on September 16th, we're going to pay $200. So from September 16th onwards, you have a balance of $290. Okay. 
Okay, so we we realized just paying ten dollars wasn't going to cut it on the principal amount. So yes. then we upped it. So then, yeah, we like we doubled down a bit. So now you pay ten dollars on August twenty eighth, and you've paid two hundred dollars on September sixteenth. Now, when you get your bill on September twenty eighth, you're going to have a charge of interest. Right. Okay. So I realize that this is a little bit of a complicated example. But it's important because I think it reflects how we treat our credit cards and how we pay back money on our credit cards. Yeah, I think it's important we do an example that could be how someone listening to this podcast is using their credit card. So the first thing we're going to do when we calculate the interest on this balance of the credit card is we're going to take our annual percentage rate and we're going to convert it into our daily percentage rate. Like that was the first step that that little clause talked about. Right. So your annual percentage rate is like it sounds for the entire year. So to go from your annual to your daily, you're just going to divide it by 365 because there are 365 days in a year. I have a question. Yes. Will your daily percentage rate be lower if it's a leap year? I don't think so. I think it is oh, always darn. constant. I think I, I'm not sure. You're just gonna you're just gonna have to go into that fine print and read it. I do know that some companies divide by 360 instead of 365, but that right. too is noted in your statement. Right. So mm-hmm. it's not as precise as down to the day. No. Okay. So now we said our APR was 20 percent. 20 percent divided by 365 is equal to 0.05%. That's our daily percentage rate. Right. Now we have that first number that they were kind of talking about in that paragraph. The second number, if you recall, was your average statement balance. Right. If you remember, we paid the balance in two parts. Yes. So in our case, from August 28th to September 15th, a balance of $490 was carried. And that's 19 days. And then from September 16th to September 27th, we carried a balance of 290 because we decided to double down and pay $200. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that balance was carried for 12 days. So if we take the average of that, considering that we have 31 days in our month, so 490 times 19 plus 290 times 12 divided by 31, will give you an average balance of $412.58. Right. So the 19 days is how long we were carrying that Mm 490. And then the 12 days is is how long we were carrying 290. Okay. Exactly. Yes. So we're just on average calculating how much money you owed. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now the calculation becomes simple because you have your average daily balance, you have your average daily rate, and you know how many days are in the month. So it's simply $412.58 multiplied by that average daily rate, which was 0.05%, multiplied by 31. And that will equal $6.39. Okay, so you owe, your interest is six thirty nine. So your original 500 is now 506.39. So we owed 500. If we had paid off 500 on the day it was due, you would have only had to pay 500. But now because we've had to pay it off in pieces, you owe an additional $6.39. Exactly. I'm thinking kind of total overall. Yes. So Lindsay, we just talked about monthly compounding. Now we're going to talk about daily compounding. So from what we've learned in our compound interest episode, do you have an idea of how we might go about this? So I'm thinking it's going to be kind of the same calculation. It's just going to happen a lot more often. And then we're going to be adding the interest each day to the principal amount that we owe and recalculating the next day's interest based off of that. Exactly. In the compound interest episode, we showed you every compound period, but for expedience, I've used the formula in this case, and we'll probably post these calculations in the show notes for those of you who are interested. But in our example, if you recall, we paid our bill in two pieces. 
So you have two principal amounts owing in a sense in your billing period. Right. So at the start, you're carrying a balance of $490. And if you remember, we carried that balance for 19 days. So we'll be compounding daily for 19 days at our daily. At our 0.05%. Yes. Yeah. So if we run that calculation, for those 19 days where you carry a balance of $490 and you compound daily at 0.05%, you're going to have interest collect of $4.68. Okay, okay. So not quite as much as like the other one, but we're not even finished yet. We're not done yet though, right? So if we think about it, we had $490, now we're going to add $4.68. And then we got wise and we're like, okay, we, we need to start paying this down. We paid another $200. Right. Right. So $490 plus $4.68 minus $200 is $294.68. And now we're going to do the same thing that we did before and compound daily for 12 days. Exactly. At our 0.05%. That'll give us how much interest just on that chunk? On that chunk, you're going to get $1.77. So our total interest then, if we're taking our four sixty eight and our $1.77, mm -hmm. would be, drum roll, $6.45. So I was anticipating that it would be <laughs> a greater difference between daily and monthly. There would be if we started off with a bigger number. Right, so it'll just be exacerbated by... Yeah. By the original amount. Exactly. So if we had started with like $1,000 and if you, if we didn't get wise and decide to pay the 200, those numbers would look different. But as you can see, compounding daily does yield more interest than compounding monthly. Okay. So Lindsay... Now that we've gone through these two examples and we've calculated interest with daily compounding and with monthly compounding, which do you think that little paragraph that I read in the beginning was describing? Okay, so I'm going back to the paragraph and I'm skimming it a little bit. That's totally cool. It was a lot to take in. <laughs> Almost <laughs> too much to take in. I'm just kidding. It's good to know how things are going on your credit card. Yes, agreed. So looking at this paragraph, though, I'm seeing a lot of the word daily, but it's but in look the at context. the context. Agreed. Yeah. Look at the context that the word daily is used. Average daily balance, which you would think would be for daily compounding, but because it's an average, why would you average it out if it compounds daily? You would just use the, the balance of that day. Mm -hmm. So I'm leaning towards monthly compounding. You're exactly right. This is describing monthly compounding to you. And in my research, this is actually the type of compounding that is used on most credit cards. Um, daily compounding is used on some, but it's often like an asterisk as like an additional option. So I guess what we're really seeing is that there's two different ways to have a credit card. You either are someone who pays it off during that grace period almost every time or every time, and then you're not running into this issue where Revolving you, credit yeah, or sticky debt. <laughs> exactly. You're not running into the interest accruing and then having to pay more. And I know there is a camp of people mm -hmm. that are having that interest accrue, and then they have what could eventually accrue into sticky debt, which we referenced in our show last week. Yeah. And actually, credit card companies have names for these two use cases of the credit card. Like they call the people who are paying off their balance every month in total transactors. And then they mm. call the individuals who are carrying a balance forward on their credit card, they call those individuals revolvers. Right. So credit card companies want people to be revolvers because that's how they make more money, right, on the interest. Yeah, it's a balance that they're trying to achieve, right? Because if they are going to make money, they need to get some money from interest. So they can't have too many transactors because transactors are actually, in some cases, making money from their credit cards if they're like collecting points, for example. Right. So in that sense, you're, you're almost gaming the system. Yeah, you're using your credit card to its fullest potential. <laughs> right. Yeah, because you 
get to use the money before you might necessarily have it. And then you get a grace period, you pay it back in total, and then you could potentially collect points, which you can use back to pay your credit card. Right. Or there's lots Mm -hmm. of different perks by various credit cards. Like uh, Scotiabank is like tied to scene points or grocery Mm -hmm. points or air miles. Um, Not that anyone is really flying right now. (laughs) <laughs> but but we will have a lot of air miles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The way to avoid debt as a consumer on your credit card is to be a transactor. So one question I had when we were preparing for the show is, how are Canadians using their credit cards? And I went to Bankruptcy Canada's website, uh, which mm-hmm. will be linked in our show notes, the article that I found. Um, and I wanted to learn a bit more about credit card debt in Canada. So. They actually have a stat on there about how many Canadians pay off their credit card each month. And I was wondering if you'd like to guess how many. Okay. I don't think it's a lot. Is it like 40%? That is a very generous guess. <laughs> it's, um, you're right that it's, it's not a lot. Uh, it's actually 25% of Canadians. So 25% are transactors. And then 75% are revolvers. Okay. So now that we know a little bit about transactors and revolvers and what the spending habits of Canadians are, we still have questions about how did we get here? Where did credit cards come from? And why does this matter to you? All of this and more after the break. All right. Welcome back, everybody. So before the break, we talked about credit cards. We talked about how they work and how we calculate interest on our balances on credit cards. And we discussed the two types of ways that interest can be calculated on credit cards. But now what I'm wondering is how did we get here? Is there a credit card origin story? All good superheroes and villains have an origin story. And credit (laughs) cards are no exception. (laughs) When most people think of credit cards today, they think of those big names like Visa and MasterCard and American Express, which we, you know, associate with with credit cards. But they didn't actually start off with these big names and these big companies. So it actually started as a way of providing customers with pocket-sized cards that allowed for the purchase of goods without cash on hand around the turn of the 20th century in large stores, like large department stores, for example. Mm -hmm. And at first, these stores gave their cards only to the wealthier clients. But then it soon, you know, kind of trickled down to to other groups as well. Okay, so it was really just like the wealthier clients that maybe wanted to buy like a big ticket item could have this option available to them. Yes, exactly. It's, okay. uh, I guess a means of convenience to get those bigger items, right? Because, yeah. you know, nowadays at department stores, you maybe go and you buy like one nice blouse. <laughs> But back in the day, right, like people were buying entire bedroom sets. Or like washing machines, I guess. (laughs) So I guess in this case, you owed not a credit card company, but the store itself. Exactly. Okay. So manufacturers sold a lot of goods by extending credit. So like a lot of big ticket items, for example, like cars. Mm -hmm. And then major retailers also began to sell selected merchandise on installment credit. And this was around the time of the First World War. And then during the 1920s, sales finance companies that extended this credit continued to grow. And then in the 1930s, which I'll remember was the Great Depression, a lot of retailers and banks adopted strategies that relied on installment lending in order to grow. So before the Great Depression, a lot of banks viewed these types of consumer loans as unprofitable and maybe even a bit, you know, disreputable. Yeah, it would tarnish the reputation of the bank. But Mm -hmm. when the stock market crashed, banks began to establish small loan departments. So that began the revolving credit account, one where stores allowed customers to carry a balance and continue making charges as long as they made their minimum monthly payments and did not exceed their credit limit. Mm. This is still at the level, though, of individual entities and... Yeah, in your individual bank is extending you the credit. Like we haven't gotten to Visa yet. 
Yes, no, Visa has not <laughs> hit the origin story. But, you know, Visa is riding on the backs of the ones that came first. Well, the first national credit card in the United States was created by the Diners Club in 1949. Mm-hmm. And at first, this credit card was kind of limited because it could only be used at certain restaurants in New York City and Los Angeles. But then they soon enrolled lots of hotels and retail stores and even an airline. I must admit, I Googled the Diners Club credit card, and I think it's still around. Really? I think so. I'd never heard of it before doing the research for this episode and learning more about it. Let's just do a quick Google. Diners Club Canada homepage. Hmm. Diners Club International. You can still get this credit card. I wonder if it has good perks, though. It's all about the perks. <laughs> yes. If you're a transactor and you can gain the full benefits of your credit card, then it is about the perks. Yes. But if you're a revolver, I think it's more about your interest rate and how it's compounding. Right. And I guess from this origin of credit cards, and now they're extremely ubiquitous, right? Like there's lots of things you can't do without a credit card or a debit card that's set up with a credit card company. Mm-hmm. We kind of have this business of debt. Yeah. At any given time, if you have a credit card, you are carrying debt. And if you're a revolver, this debt actually makes money for the people that you owe the money to. Right. And if, for example, it's compounding quicker than you can pay it off, then it's sticking to you. Like you can't get rid of it. It's only getting larger. And this is where we get those instances of like people who are carrying large amounts of credit card debt. Do you actually know how much credit card debt on average Canadians carry? I looked up a few numbers because I was wondering about consumer debt in Canada. And there's kind of two different ways they represent it. So okay, I have September 2020 numbers from Equifax Canada. Okay, hit me. Okay, so the average debt per person in Canada across all, all debt, including mortgage debt, is $73,532. Okay. And then if we exclude mortgage debt? $23,035 per person. That's consumer debt. And consumer debt consists of personal debts that are owed as a result of purchasing goods. So for example, credit card debt, student loans, auto loans, mortgages, and payday loans are consumer debt. And something to remember is that this is an average, right? So Mm -hmm. it's all the people out there living debt-free. There's people taking their $73,000. So, Lindsay, how should we select a credit card? Well, I think this depends on your credit card habits and why you're getting a credit card Mm -hmm. and what you intend to use it for, right? So it requires a bit of reflection, Like you mentioned, someone who's a revolver might be looking for the best interest rate, whereas a transactor might be like, let's get all the benefits. What can I get? (laughs) Yeah. So the best interest rate, meaning the lowest interest rate. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) I, I guess something I wanted to say is that it's okay to ask questions when you're getting a credit card or when you're applying for a credit card. Like, I don't know what your experience was when you were applying for your credit card, but I went into the bank and I was like, what's the interest rate? And she was like, oh, it's like X percent, but you don't have to worry about that because you'll always pay it off on time. And that was the end of the conversation. But I regret not asking questions because I didn't know how my interest was calculated until I had to look at the fine print. For this episode. For this episode, yeah. They had a lot of faith in you, right? (laughs) Saying, oh, you'll pay it off, don't worry. Or they had a lot of faith in me, or perhaps they thought I would become a revolver and generate interest. (laughs) They were hoping. (laughs) (laughs) So, Lindsay, do you know what time it is? I think it's my favorite time of the whole episode. Me too. (laughs) It's time for our science seed. So each episode, we like to give our listeners something to think about. A little science nugget to help you think more critically about the numbers and statistics that you encounter every day. And for this mini-series, we've adapted our science seed, and now we're calling it, wait for it, a finance seed. Very, very creative, we know. So for this episode, the finance seed that we'd like to leave you with is to think about spending less than you make so that you can avoid things like sticky debt 
or you can become a transactor and not a revolver. I think that's a great takeaway. And we do understand, though, that not everyone's in the same financial situation. And not everyone has the ability to do that all the time. But if you are in the position to do so, living within your means, making sure that you're paying off your credit card during that grace period to avoid interest is going to really help you out in the long run. Mm -hmm. And I would also encourage you guys to like maybe pull out the fine print on your credit card statement and read it. Like we'd like to know how many of you are compounding daily, how many compounding monthly. Have fun with it. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening, everyone. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you find your podcasts. You can find the references we used for this episode in our show notes. A special thank you to Julian Bertino, who does our sound editing and music. Have an idea for what number we should cover next? Or do you maybe you want to learn more? Follow us on Instagram at The Secret Life of Numbers. We'll catch you next time on The Secret Life of Numbers, where the numbers can run, but they can't hide. <laughs>